So the first time I encountered Doom, my, my brother and his friend uh, went to a computer show on the other side of town uh, that I wasn't allowed to go to. Uh, it came back with a small black disc. We marathon gamed from, you know, 8 p.m. until about 4 in the morning when my parents were stomping, you know, on the second story because they could still hear the shotgun blast through the subwoofer. We're in college. I live on the all-girls floor of my co-ed building. There was, of course, also an all-boys floor, which, of course, is where we all went. So the lights in the hallway had been shut off, and there's horrible noises coming out of people's rooms, punctuated by, yeah, once in a while, and no. Back then, in the early 90s, my friends were telling me, oh, man, when you play Doom, it's so awesome that you, you get nauseous in that first-person shooter. I was like, oh, really? Punks playing it, I'm like, oh. Doom was doom. It was bloody. It was violent. It was you mowing through demons with a shotgun and a chainsaw, for goodness sake. It was so revolutionary that it was terrifying. It was almost going into a haunted house, I guess, on your own. You, you shot a gun, something blew up into a cloud of pixelated blood, and it was just perfect cause and effect. And it just, I, I couldn't stop playing it. It's just that struggle of good and evil that somebody can, you know, for half an hour at a time, kind of jump in and put his forehead, you know, against the devil and just beat his ass down. There are so many people that can harken back to that time in the college dorms or at the office after hours or whatever where they were playing Doom. And we've got a lot of permeation into the general culture. It originally released, released uh, Wolfenstein 3D. Wolfenstein 3D was really the, the grandfather of all, the whole genre of the first-person shooter. It was fun, it was a first-person game, you saw over the barrel of your gun, you went to these brightly colored, simple rooms, nothing was lit, you'd open a door, a dog or a soldier would come at you, you'd shoot them and that was your experience. We wanted to do something more gritty. We had tossed around a number of different ideas, even things like car racing games and, and stuff like that, but when we sat down and started thinking about it, what we want to do is take that type of, of that first person action, that adrenaline pumping action, and take it to a new level. Even at the title screen, I knew that this was something amazing that they had just stumbled upon. I saw Doom, it melted away, and then the demo of the first level was playing. And the, the hardcore music kicked in, and you saw the little skull with the glowing red eyes. It was just, it was an amazing experience. I knew where I wanted to go with the next step in graphics, which involved getting away from these block-based worlds. We wanted to be able to have worlds that were a lot more freeform so that we could have pentagonal rooms and uh, columns in the middle of areas and things that weren't just these 64 by 64 blocks that we had had for everything before. We added lighting for the first time so we could have dark areas and flickering lights and we knew we could do a lot of things here that would have more of this horror, creepy atmosphere to it, that it wasn't all brightly lit, pure action on there. We could start bringing in some sense of dread or foreboding and uh, areas that people could be scared of rather than just startled. We're trying to set up a sense of tension in the world of hearing sounds hearing monsters creeping around corners. What they did better than anybody else was the sense of urgency. Uh, and, and everything played into that, from the constant onslaught of enemies to that, you know, when you'd beat a round, it would give you your point total. Which, today's games don't bother with that, because they figure you don't care. But what was great was, Doom was always about the race to that final red panel. If you have to mow down 30 pink demons with a chainsaw, whatever you gotta do, get to that panel, and it was just, it was the ultimate adrenaline rush. It's the same thing over and over, but it's the right same thing. So it's just like, oh wow, I got through that room. I just wanna see what's next. I just wanna see what's next. Maybe there's a new monster, maybe there's a new weapon. It's, it's the classic thing that happens to a lot of people that are playing a game that's really good. You're playing it, and then you look at the clock, and you're like, it's 2 a.m.? You're like, oh, like, and then that dirty feeling sets in, like, I really, okay. <laughs> you feel like you need to call someone and confess, like something, like you just realize this thing completely got a hold of you. It was really the game that popularized the whole first-person shooter genre. You are that character, and there's a greater sense of threat when you're playing a game like that. And like, you know, you look at it, you lose your peripheral vision, you are really immersed inside of that game. Enemies were just flying at you. It really showed you how fast-paced 
in theory as a first person shooter could be. The levels were designed well. It was, you know, just interesting different areas. I mean, it really just pulled a whole bunch of like nascent concepts in the first person shooter era. It just sort of pulled them all together in one game. It's now you inside the world. And when something jumps out and startles you, you have people falling out of their chairs, you know, do dodging their heads side to side as things are coming at them on the monitor. What we call it is the head dodge. So you get this and this and this as the rockets are coming at them on the screen. And you get the character empathy that, that is literally unparalleled in any other form of game. The worst experience on the first level is walking through uh, a door, there's a winding pathway and green ooze on either side, and in the corner of the room you just hear the, the imp creature. You can look up and you can see him a little bit, but you just hear him with this awful groaning this, uh, noise, and you don't know exactly where it's coming from. You see him, and by the time you see him, there's a fireball in your face. Doom was so irreverent and underground that it was almost like you know, you're doing something that you weren't supposed to get caught doing when you were playing Doom. It was no apologies. There was no sort of content censorship. It was like the first time you really saw a game, I was like, wow. I mean, I, I think it was a seminal event. It, was, it felt adult. It, it really sort of made people wake up and people who are bankers, people who are lawyers, were suddenly playing a video game. And, like, and, and that was such a massive shift and it's really sort of, changed the way that the game industry saw itself and they saw this whole new market. It wasn't just colorful stuff for young kids. There was a key moment that I can remember during the development where the game was being worked on, someone was playing it, and I noticed that the janitor that comes in and picks up the trash had just been sitting there staring at the screen for a very long time watching it. And that was one of the points where we really knew that we had crossed the threshold where people that didn't classify themselves as gamers could look at this and be drawn into the world. The thing about Doom is that Doom hit at the right time. Uh, the internet was still in, in a lot of ways in its infancy. People weren't sure exactly how to distribute games and software and this, that, the other. And id really built a following for this. They said, we're going to release this game. It's gonna be amazing. They put up servers for it. They said, everybody get ready because Doom's coming. I think they popularized this concept of they knew that their games were the best out there, so they were gonna give you a little sample and then you would give them money and then get the rest. And they had an install base of millions on these sample levels. There was apparently a study Microsoft had done at one point that said there were more copies of Doom installed than Windows in the early days. And this was when we had our shareware versions that people could pretty much freely distribute. And while we sold you know, and maybe two million copies or something of the, the early commercial Doom versions on there, there were many tens of millions of copies of the shareware version that had been out there and played. I don't think that there was any doubt that, uh, that Doom was gonna be a huge success uh, for the company, but I don't think that, that anybody really grasped the magnitude that it would have on the industry. I remember seeing a post on Carmack's blog or on a news website that said, they sat down at a table and said, well, what are we doing next? You know, someone threw out, how about Doom 3? And the group kind of nervously laughed or whatever, and then that's when they looked at each other and said, okay, you know, it's time. Doom 3, as far as the decision to do, was a somewhat controversial in, in, inside the company. Me personally, I was a little bit worried about tackling Doom 3 because it's such a big responsibility. There's so many people that are just major fans of it. Working on the new Doom title was definitely stressful because the whole world had an idea of what they wanted Doom to be, the new Doom game. When we embarked on the project, we really knew that we were going to be changing what people were going to expect to see and experience in a video game. And there was an interesting interrelationship between technology and what we were doing from the visual side. It was the beginning of a new era of technology for video games. This was a new era of the technology behind the graphics, where just you sat up and you're like, wow, that's amazing. I mean, the fact that Doom 3 was released and most PCs, even like our top of the line PCs, could not play it at the level it could be played. It was made for something further down the line. You know, I'm, I'm, I want to be five years from now and just crank that thing up for like, you know, 1200 by 1200 resolution, and just go, yeah. With 
the same number of sort of data that had to be crunched through the computer, we were able to render much more lifelike, uh, much more realistic, uh, almost ultra or, or hyper-realistic environments and characters in the world. And so when people saw uh, the game for the very first time, uh, when they sat down and experienced it in, in a theater at E3 in 2002, we had to remind them that what they were showing was actually being run in real time and was not sort of an in-game cinematic or a movie that had been drawn up beforehand and was just being played over again. In the first 20 minutes, I was screaming like a little girl when things started to pop out of the shadows. It's this great spook house. This is, you know, fun house ride where it's like, oh God, I don't know if I want to go into that room. We could go beyond players' imagination with things that, you know, literally would jump out at them through walls, from the floor, that they couldn't even conceive of, maybe even in their worst nightmares. A lot of people got exactly what they wanted from Doom 3, which was the Doom experience all over again, but this time, it was the Doom experience times 1,000. It had these, these creatures that were now, you know, drooling, you know, that when they snarled, it wasn't just one frame animation, mouth open, mouth closed. They would get in your face, their mouths would gape wide open, you would hear them, the lights would go out, something would shatter, and now the room is filled with spiders. It took these kind of crew designs from the time and really fleshed them out into far more terrifying creatures. But you knew what they were, and it was exciting to, to see them that way. Bravo team, entry secure. Move in and take positions. Doom 3 was like a huge, a huge gaming event. People were lining up in the stores. People were very excited for it. The graphics were everything they were said to be and more. It was slower paced. There weren't hordes of enemies like piling upon you. It was just kind of a different take on the same game. The early Doom games had a lot of memorable moments where you were just mowing down crowds of creatures. While in Doom 3, it's much more up close and personal, where a specific monster will terrify you. It's sometimes seeing that one particular monster that comes out scares you to death and you run away from and hope you're not getting run down from behind. Every publisher and every game developer wants their doom. That's, that's the effect that this game and this franchise has had on the market, in my opinion. It's the one game that no company can ever have ever again because it hit at the right time, it had the graphics, it had the sound, it had the technology, and it had the fans. People devote sometimes hundreds or even thousands of hours of their lives in playing these games, and so the game has a place in their life that's even more than it sort of than it holds with the people who develop the game. We don't do testing, uh, you know, focus testing and group testing and things like that. We're gamers, uh, we love to play games. Uh, we know what we like when we see it, and we basically work on a game until it's something that we think is cool. I look around at how big it's all become, and it all comes from just a few of us sitting in our office trying to make a neat game. And over the years, the neat games have become much neater, and things have gotten bigger and better. But it's been this process of we just sit down and we, we work on our tasks, and things that we have to do today, things that we're working on for the next project and we build the games, we care about how they come out, we want them to be good, and they have been good and they've been successful. And here we have you know, millions of people that have really enjoyed the products, and that's, it's heartwarming. Ah!